to Covert Shores question and answer session. I'm H.I. Sutton. I run the Covert Shores website. It's about submarines, special forces, underwater vehicles, narco subs, all that sort of strange underwater stuff. Someone suggested that I did a Q&A. Um, so this is first time out. It's unscripted, but I have prepared materials. There's a lot of questions. I apologize if I haven't been able to answer your question. I'll do my best to get through um, quite a lot of them, though, and hopefully ones that are interesting to uh, to a lot of people. Let's get on with it. So first question from Kyle Mizukami. Um, are there any missions which submarines should be doing that they are not doing? Yeah, I bet there are. Um, the one that comes to mind, the one I'm passionate about is as a host submarine for uncrewed underwater vehicles or UUVs. I think that submarines are going to play um, a bigger and bigger part in, in this. So crewed submarines carrying, deploying, recovering uncrewed underwater vehicles. This visual is just a sort of a hypothetical uh, mock-up that I did showing a British Vanguard class submarine converted to be a host submarine for UUVs. It's not a serious proposal. It's not going to happen. Um, it's just illustrative. But I think it will um, it will happen in some form sooner or later. And uncrewed underwater vehicles are already being carried by submarines, of course, but in small numbers and as a, a sort of an afterthought, I think it will become a design priority and it will become a new type of submarine whose primary mission is to carry such vehicles. Second question from Simon Bolivia. Um, is there a mini sub which has a universal docking collar like featured in Hunt for Red October? Hunt for Red October, of course, should be everyone's second favorite submarine film. Um, it's brilliant, a highly recommended film. Um, the DSRV, um, so I don't wanna, you know, I don't wanna be a spoiler. Um, if you haven't seen the movie, A, you should have done, B, just switch away for, for a minute. Um, part of the, the plot has a deep submergence rescue vehicle um, going from one submarine to another. And the submarine it docks with is a Russian submarine. And the question is, would, is that viable? Are there submarines that can do that? I think the easy answer in the absolute sense is probably no. There must be. I'm sure be at least one type of submarine out there that is not compatible with any deep submersion rescue vehicle. Uh, North Korean subs, for example, probably are not built with that as a priority. Um, however, a lot of subs are, and actually, yes, um, deep submersion rescue vehicles from one country do, uh, can dock with um, submarines from another, even in extreme cases between the US submarine and, uh, and a Russian submarine. So Exercise Bold Monarch in 2011, um, there was a NATO exercise and a Russian Kilo class submarine, Al Rosa, uh, participated in the exercise, um, which was a rescue mission yeah, exercise. And NATO and US rescue vehicles docked with the submarine at 114 meters below the surface of Mediterranean. Mediterranean, they docked multiple times absolutely proves that a NATO or Western rescue vehicle can dock successfully with a Russian submarine. Very cool that they did that. Ants Vigil asks, how many of the world's navies have a submarine rescue capability? I didn't do a full research on this, so this is going by just the ones at the top of my mind. Um, these are countries that operate deep submersion rescue vehicles, with one caveat being America, but I'll come to that. Um, top left, you've got NATO. Um, there's the US, uh, sorry, the UK, France, and Norway together operate a deep submersion rescue vehicle. Um, and the US does operate rescue vehicles, but they're not, they're not submarines they're more like a diving bell it's actually an australian design um pretty cool in its own way but slightly different um they used to operate deep submersions rescue vehicles in fact they pioneered it um other countries that have built their own 
Sweden, Japan, Russia, Italy, and China all operate indigenous um, deep submersions rescue vehicles. Also, India, South Korea, Vietnam, Singapore, and Australia operate um, British designed or built uh, rescue vehicles. If anyone you know, knows that I've got that wrong, let me know. Um, my memory might not be perfect. China also operates British in, uh, imported ones in addition to its locally designed ones. Um, there's a few other navies to think of that have some form of rescue capability, like Brazil, for example, diving bells, um, not DSRV. So. Um, and they must, you know, if you dig deep enough, I'm sure many submarine operating countries do have them. Okay, next question. On Warfare asked me to rate my top five SSKs. I didn't know whether I should answer this type of question. I, I thought, well, I'm going to get questions like this. What's my favorite submarine? Um, it's very hard. I'm going to try to be very objective. I'm going to explain why I, I think they are. And if your country's you know, submarine is not in the list, don't be offended, don't be bothered, don't feel the need to, to explain that the submarine exists. Um, just just uh, let it be. Um, I'm gonna first of all though, pick on one letter in the designation SSK. SSK is common parlance for an advanced non-nuclear submarine. What it actually means, however, or at least originally, is an anti-submarine capable submarine that does not have nuclear power. Um, I'm gonna focus a little bit on the anti-submarine. It'll make it easier to say these are the top five. The first one, the easy one, um, is the latest Japanese submarines. Um, there, there's no doubt that these are extremely sophisticated. Um, they're surely extremely capable um, in the anti-submarine capabilities. Like all submarines, we don't actually know their detailed performance. We don't know how good they are because that's classified. But there's, there's, uh, they're clear clearly up there. They're also very large as far as non-nuclear submarines go, and I think that's a benefit um, in operational terms. The latest ones um, have lithium-ion batteries, um, which is uh, cutting-edge technology. Um, Japan was the first. These submarines are the first to, op to have that, and it could promise to make them better at anti-submarine warfare. Second choice is an interesting one. A26 from, from Sweden. This submarine has not yet been launched, but they are this couple under construction. It's a really interesting submarine. From the um, anti-submarine front, what's particularly interesting about it, I think, is the torpedo system. There's two new types of torpedo carried. The heavyweight torpedo is a wire-guided torpedo, as you would expect. But there's also the lightweight, the 400 millimeter torpedoes. This actually goes back some time in, in the Swedish arsenal. But one interesting advantage of these is that they can be launched two at a time from a single torpedo tube. So you can put one, one after the other through the same torpedo tube at the same time. And Swedish submarines have a good track record of launching large numbers of torpedoes simultaneously while guiding them to separate targets wire guiding them around islands or other obstacles and so on. So particularly in shallow water, particularly in the Baltic, I think that this is a really interesting and differentiating anti-submarine platform. It's also got a special forces um, capability, emphasis even, um, but let's stick to the anti-submarine aspect. Another sort of no-brainer is the new um, non-nuclear versions of the Sufren or Barracuda class, the French, the French uh, nuclear submarine. Um, it's available in non-nuclear forms. The only customer so far is Australia, who have ordered it as the attack class. Of the choices that I'm going to lay out, this is a little bit one of the harder ones. It's not the newest submarine. Uh, sorry, rather, it's not yet constructed, so it is the newest submarine. Um, if it inherits a lot of capabilities from the nuclear uh, big brother, then it will be surely very, very capable. 
um, in the anti-submarine world. Um, obviously, I'm sure the Australian version will differ in quite a number of details to the, the French version, um, but it really is going to be up there. It's also going to be a, by far the largest non-nuclear attack submarine, um, certainly that we're aware of. And again, I see that as an advantage. I'm going to go for the Type 212A uh, and the Type 212 family, should I say. Um, this was developed by Germany and Italy. Um, the, the illustration here, one of my cutaways, these, these drawings are by me, by the way, if you, when you see these in the presentation. Um, this is the Italian version, very well armed. The, everything the same could be said for the, the German version. It's got fuel cell AIP, so air independent power. Um, I think there's a, a lot of good potential in the anti-submarine world. Germany also makes quite a few export submarines. The latest model, the 218SG uh, for Singapore, I think is also probably up there. But I, you know, if you had to choose a German submarine to say it's the best SSK, it's probably the one that's operated by the Home Navy. Um, so this is a very, very capable submarine. The latest versions, I don't have a cutaway of it, but the um, 212CD would surely be the the one to choose um, of the variants, but that's not um, yet been constructed. Um, I think it deserves a cutaway of its own at some point. Very interesting, so. I'm gonna go out on a limb here a little bit. I think the Lada class can easily make an argument for being one of the best SSKs. Um, Russia has a strong tradition of submarine building and obviously builds nuclear submarines. They also build non-nuclear submarines. Um, the Kilo class is probably most famous right now. The Lada class is a more modern, cheaper, uh, smaller um, counterpart to the to Kilo class. It's had something of a troubled um, development. It doesn't have AIP, I believe, but versus the Kilo class, it's probably much more capable. The first thing is it has a towed sonar array, which a lot of non-nuclear submarines lack, um, not the ones that I've mentioned so far, but other ones. Um, but what makes it stand out for me is the sonar array. This is an image of it. It's a conformal array and it's massive. As far as non-nuclear submarines go, it's probably the biggest, certainly up there. It probably gives it a very good anti-submarine capability. So that was my top five SSKs. I say, if you don't agree with it, apologies, but yeah, that's, that is what it is. Um, the next question, again, from Kyle. Um, as the world turns back to big power warfare, what are the anti-ship capabilities of major subs? I'm going to partly answer this because it's that's, you know, a big, big question. Um, obviously, there's torpedoes and they're devastating for ships. Um, I'm going to focus a little bit on the resurgence of anti-ship missiles on submarines. They were going out of favor, certainly with the US. Um, harpoons were seen as sort of not a particularly useful thing to have aboard a submarine. Um, more recently, they are coming back to the fore. And this is a very recent photo of a harpoon, a sub-harpoon, so a submarine launched harpoon anti-ship missile being loaded onto a submarine. Um, just in July. And it's, it's interesting. The reason is that regardless of the type of anti-ship missile, it's going to be very short ranged unless you can get off board targeting. So your exosets, um, your uh, sub harpoons, things like that, they're, they're going to be shorter ranged than often you read about um, when you read the specs on Wikipedia or whatever. Um, they're not they're not as dangerous as a torpedo in some respects, but they do might have some tactical advantages. Um, obviously, you know, flying over islands, whatever. So I think it's interesting that they're going back that way. Um, also to note that American submarines do carry a lot of Tomahawk cruise missiles. Those are being upgraded to have the anti-ship capability again. Um, that will be the Block 5, and apparently all, all Tomahawks will eventually be upgraded to um, or, or switched out with Block 5s. And that is uh, going to make every missile on a 
US submarine and anti-ship missile, um, which will be a, a big leap in that capability. But you've got to be fair, if you want to talk about anti-ship missile oriented submarines, um, it's much more a focus in China, it's even more a focus in Russia, and probably the king is the Yasin class. Um, these are armed with essentially two, two main types of anti-ship cruise missile. The main one is the Onyx. This is a supersonic missile. It can also attack land targets. They have land attack cruise missiles as well, they have the caliber, um, and they potentially have the Zircon. Um, it's, it's expected soon that it's being tested. We should list it. Um, that is a hypersonic anti-ship missile. Um, so that is the, for the moment, probably the most advanced and conceptually at least the most potent um, anti-ship weapon aboard any submarine other than torpedoes, of course. And, you know, I think it's really interesting that Russia focuses on this. The US Navy is going a little bit more back to this direction, but still the emphasis I'd say is more on, on land attack that anti-ship. Pros and cons of sailless submarine designs. So John Andres asked this. Um, it's interesting because the US Navy has recently requested uh, proposals to have an inflatable sail. So the sail or fin, if you're, you know, um, for the Royal Navy parlance, is the structure that sticks up out the middle of the submarine. Um, Ideally, you do away with it, at least there's that school of thought. An inflatable one would allow the US Navy to do away with it. Um, I'll come to why in a moment. Um, China is already ahead here. Um, there is a submarine, I call it a sailor submarine because we don't know any other name for it. Um, it's a full-size submarine, not the biggest by any means, but it's a full-size submarine. It's been built in China. And as you can see, it's missing the usual sail that you'd expect to see on the back. There is a bump. Um, but it's not substantial, it's not what you'd call a sail. Um, so whether or not Russia, uh, sorry, China um, makes this a, a regular thing, I don't know. But the US Navy, the Russian Navy have seriously considered sailor submarines going back at least to the 1950s. Um, and obviously some of the first submarines had, didn't have sails, but that's probably, that's a very different reason. Um, so what are the pros and cons? Let's get to it. The pros for not having a sail would be lower drag. So your submarine should be faster. It should have lower flow noise. So stealthier, quieter. Um, and there isn't a sort of hydrofoil or aerofoil um, effect when the submarines at high angles are rolled. There's a risk with a sail that if the submarine banks when it's turning too much, suddenly the sail becomes an unintended hydroplane and could even make the submarine sort of flip upside down, would be a, a real worry. So there is that, obviously submarines try to mitigate that, but uh, there is that risk of sails. The cons though, why, you know, if there's all these advantages, why do submarines have sails? If you didn't have a sail, there wouldn't be a safe exit high enough above the waterline. And I think that's why the Chinese example does have a bump. That's probably got the, uh, you know, the hatch to the inside as high as possible um, above the waterline. Um, obviously, you need some a door that you can open, basically, um, that doesn't let the water in um, when the submarine is on the surface. Also, on the surface, it needs to have a navigation bridge. And this is why the US Navy wants an inflatable sail. Um, Many locations um, and, and or many navies want to have a, humans um, up on the bridge, you know, uh, controlling um, the submarine while it's uh, docking or being sailing out of out port. Um, that has to be as high out of the water as possible for practical reasons. Um, yeah, you need to sail. That's what you do. You put that as, at the top of the sail. Um, there's also an interesting. Um, issue some submarines might have a suction effect if they as periscope depth in some sea, sea conditions where the submarine will unexpectedly or unintentionally rise to the surface and just pop up um, the sail moves the hull much further down 
from the, the surface of the water and reduces the risk of this. Um, I'm not a, uh, a naval architect, so I don't fully understand the hydrodynamics at play, but that's as I understand. Um, the last one is the challenges around the masts. I, this is solvable and there are lots of ideas on it, but essentially um, the sail is a very convenient place to put your masts and in particular your periscopes or in the modern terms, uh, optronics masts, so sort of you know, electro-optical periscopes. These are non-penetrating masks. You hear the term non-penetrating masks quite a lot. What it means is that they don't go all the way down into the main hull of the submarine. This is much safer when there's a collision, and there are collisions you read about in the news occasionally. Um, the periscope often hits an object such as a boat and bends. And if that goes into the hull, it could cause a leak. So if you just contain it in the sail and it doesn't go into the hull, then there's li very little risk of, of that happening, um, which is great. So if you don't have a sail, where are you gonna put the, these masks? You put them back in the hull again, and therefore you reintroduce that problem that traditional periscopes had. Um, another option though is folding masks. Um, you still need to do some design work though, that's for sure. On warfare asks, should the US Navy develop and field air independent power sub equipped submarines to supplement their, their nuclear powered submarines? Interesting one. I'm, I'm of the sort of group that says yes. It's controversial for you. Um, I'll explain why I think they should um, and I'll also give an, a brief outline of some of the arguments against it. Um, obviously, nuclear submarines are overall more capable, but in certain tactical conditions, they're not necessarily at their best, and particularly in littoral, so in, in close into the shore, in shallow water. Um, and non-nuclear submarines, particularly ones with AIP, air independent power, or equivalent, you know, modern battery technologies that are emerging, could be really valuable and cheaper um, complements to nuclear submarines. The downside of them is they're much slower generally and they don't therefore cannot cover anything like the amount of ocean so you'd have to forward deploy them so you'd need to invest in the infrastructure to get the submarines where you're going to need them. Um, I think that's completely achievable. The arguments against it, um, the main one is sort of viewed as the nuclear mafia. Um, so if a Navy you know, has uh, non-nuclear submarines and nuclear submarines, there's a risk that politicians will say, well, the non-nuclear ones are much cheaper. We should have those instead. And they'll start having it instead of nuclear submarines, not as well off. I'm arguing they should have them in addition to, not instead of. Um, I make the same argument for the Royal Navy, although it's much less realistic. Um, funding's never enough for the Royal Navy. Um, but, you know, on... On paper, as it were, I believe that both Royal Navy and the US Navy should have some non-nuclear submarines for certain roles, particularly special forces um, and other inshore activities. Um, this is just a sketch I did. It's not, it's not serious. Um, it illustrates um, a slightly futuristic um, non-nuclear submarine for the US Navy to fulfill in inshore tasks that um, nuclear submarines are too valuable to expose to mainly special forces, uncrewed underwater vehicles, things like that. This submarine happens to be sailless. That's also why I chose it. Um, so previous question about sails. Um, it's not going to happen. John Andrus also asks, how easy is it to implement a pump jet on the existing design, e.g. Al Rosa? I think you've answered your own question there. Um, is being done, the submarine called Al Rosa. That submarine is a Russian one, here it is. It's the same one that the rescue submarine, so the NATO rescue submarine is docked with, coincidentally. Um, and you can see the yellow arrow points to a pump jet. Um, pump jets are normally seen on nuclear submarines. And the, in fact, this is the only major example I can think of of a pump jet on a non-nuclear submarine. Um, it was clearly done for experimental reasons. Um, no other kilos carry it. How easy would it be? Clearly, some engineering has to take place around balance, things like that. The pump jet is going to be heavier, um, potentially need different gearing and things like that than a screw. Um, however, 
um, it could be done. It's clearly um, possible. I think the reason you don't see them isn't because it's not physically possible, it's because it's not necessary or desirable. Pump jets, you know, we could fall in trap of thinking they're universally better than screws or, or propellers um, uh, or, or other um, types of propulsion. The, the thing is, it's all about speed. Nuclear submarines that have them are optimized for much faster transit and um, they want a pump jet because it's going to be quieter and more efficient at certain higher speeds. Um, Non-nuclear submarines, generally, especially AIP ones, are going to be cruising around very, very slowly. They don't need to pump jet. And it might not even be as efficient or effective for them. Um, again, a caveat, I'm not a naval architect. This is just my sort of uh, layperson's understanding. John also asks how effective are anti-submarine torpedoes. I'm going to um, focus only on the submarine launched anti-submarine torpedoes. I mean, it's a very interesting topic. I think you're going to see much more of it. They must logically be quite effective. Otherwise, navies wouldn't be so seriously exploring them. I, I would guess that you are going to see them on US Navy, Royal Navy submarines at some point in the future. This Sea Spider um, on the screen is a German model. Um, it's rocket propelled, which is quite interesting. It can be fired from um, service ships against torpedoes, or it can be fired from a submarine against an incoming torpedo. There's two main ways that these sorts of anti-torpedo torpedoes can work. The first one is, as you'd expect a traditional torpedo, it homes in on the incoming torpedo and explodes and stops it. Um, another um, way it could work is to be a decoy and the, the it lures the incoming torpedo to it and then when the torpedo gets there it explodes and nullifies them um, it destroys the incoming torpedo um, i think both ideas are out there um, and you'll see variations there are other ideas um certainly thinking back of you know to cold war of using torpedoes regular torpedoes to return down the line of the incoming torpedo and sever the control wires or or make the um the controlling submarine switch paths it's particularly the uh the russian navy um super cavitating um weapons uh, but i think here we're talking about small torpedoes carried in addition to regular ones whose sole purpose is to counter um an incoming torpedo i think you'll see much more of them certainly an idea has been taken Kyle um, asks, are there any other submarines which out there with special mission capabilities like Jimmy Carter? I think Kyle knows the answer. Yes, there are. Just to clarify, Jimmy Carter is the last of the Seawolf class submarines. There's only three built. It's the third one. It has a hull extension with all sorts of super gadgets for spies, basically. Um, it's capable of seabed warfare. We, there's a lot that that we don't know about it. It's very classified, very secretive submarine, but it's there's no hiding the fact that it's been modified to conduct seabed warfare. Um, so the arrow points to a big hull extension. Yes, there are. Um, obviously, all submarines could be used for some degree of covert operations, but in particular in Russia, there's a whole fleet of them. And um, BS-64 is the currently the, the biggest and best, although there's new ones being built, such as Belgorod. Um, as you can see, it's a large submarine that can carry things on its back and it carries another submarine underneath it. That submarine is quite famous, more famous than BS-64, actually, it's, it's Le Charic. Um, It suffered a fire um, in 2019. Um, that is a very deep diving submarine. So the host submarine, the uh, BS-64, will loiter in the area and Le Charic will drop down from below the keel of the, the host submarine go and do the mission on the seabed and then come back. Just for size comparison, here's US Jimmy Carter, USS Jimmy Carter. Overall, it's a smaller submarine than the Delta, um, partly just because the Delta class is double hulled, so it's going to be a larger outside dimensions for the same inside dimensions. But um, yeah, it's uh, these are really big submarines that Russia has dedicated to this. Some of the biggest submarines in the world. Um, and they're essentially spy missions, spy submarines. More should be talked about these, but of course, if you follow my covert Shores website, you'll probably already know about these submarines. 
BC asks, what are the pros and cons of X form rudders versus cross form rudders on submarines? Yeah, most submarines have what we could call a, a cross form or cruciform um, arrangement. I'll, I'll describe that in the next slide. But since the 1960s, um, countries have experimented or adopted um, X form rudders. You can see them quite visually here on the very first submarine to have them, USS Albacore. It was fitted with them in 1960, 61, I think. Um, subsequently, US Navy submarines didn't adopt these, um, but they were adopted by countries like um, uh, Sweden was probably the first, Yugoslavia um, adopted them, then more recently, Germany. Um, so, oh, and Japan, of course. Um, so they're quite common now on submarines, but the US Navy seems to be going back towards them, as does the Royal Navy, um, but only now. Um, so why? What are the pros and cons? Why have navies like the US Navy and the Royal Navy held off for so long? Well, the cruciform or the cross plus sign, whatever you want to call it, arrangement has typically has very large vertical rudders. So it's up and above and below the submarine um, to give it high agility in a horizontal plane. So to be able to turn in very tight, tight turns. You want to be agile horizontally. Um, they call this low tactical diameters, how, how, you know, how quickly it can turn, basically. Um, but equally, you want to have quite small hydroplanes. They're the ones, um, the orange ones, that uh, go up and down to make the submarine dive or, or, or climb. Because um, you want stability in that plane, especially if you're going fast, because there's a risk if you pitch down or up, but particularly down, you could have um, a depth excursion. You could go too deep, potentially even crush the submarine. Um, there's also, because there's smaller control services, it's a bit safer if they jam. This can happen where the control services jam up or down or whatever is generally generally um, going to be safer. So the main reason to have cruciform ones is about agility and safety, um, particularly safety. But cruciform ones, like I say, they've been used since the 60s um, and they're increasingly used now and they're going to be in the future be used even on um, US Navy and Royal Navy large submarines. Um, they're good for all round agility. They can, they've got agility in both dimensions, both up and down and sideways, the same agility. They've got a lot of clearance for to kill. This is particularly good in shallow waters. Um, not why I think the, the US Navy or Royal Navy is going that way, but um, you can see they don't, they don't hang down below the submarine as much as a lower rudder on a cruciform um, setup. There's a lot of control redundancy. If one of them breaks or jams, the other three can still be used to steer the sub, to guide the submarine. This is quite important. And also note that, and the same with cruciform, increasingly all of the control services are independent of all the others. So if one breaks, the others don't. They're not, they're not all mechanically or physically connected in the way that they used to be. Um, there's also potentially signature reductions. Um, the big difference though is about safety. This is made much safer now because of modern control systems, basically. Um, the confidence uh, in overcoming the complexity of controlling them is, is getting more confident. Um, and that allows for submarines that are you know, going to go faster and deeper um, to operate uh, with, with confidence with an X form rudder. Okay, next question from Will Fenwick is um, not actually about submarines, that's cool. Um, I don't only write about submarines. Various news sources have stated that Rwandan Marines um, assets are involved in the recapture of Mokimbo. I should have looked that one up before I said it. Um, from the Islamic State, basically, in Mozambique. Um, do you have any knowledge as to what types of vessels were banners employed? Yes, those vessels were very interesting, and it happens, I do know what they are. Um, so they look something like this. You get there's quite a few photos out there. I don't unfortunately know exactly where the photos are coming from, so I can't give full credit, but they're brilliant photos of really interesting boats. 
I hadn't seen him before. Um, I don't pay much attention to to some navies and the Rwandan um, navy was on that list. They had landlocked. It's actually the Marines that operate them. Um, they've had these boats since at least, um, I think, 2008, maybe 2006. I'm going by memory, but somewhere about that. I didn't recognize them at first. You look at the hull, it's very unusual. What they actually are, are rigid inflatable boats, but without the inflatable collar. They Either it's been removed or it was never fitted. They don't have the inflatable collar they mentioned. They're actually Fabio Buzzi um, rigid inflatable boats from Italy. Um, these are normally seen as racing boats, but obviously these are the military version you've got, got here with the radar and gun, a Chinese made gun, by the way. Um, so they're like, they're gonna be wickedly quick. Um, very cool, they're very well maintained. Rwandan Marines seem to be very professional. Um, not like a lot of other um, armies and navies. So that's why it looks so unusual. They're missing the collar. Imagine them with an inflatable collar, then you'd start to say, ah, that's what they are. Um, cool. Marshall Friff asks, why isn't there a modern I-400 submarine to launch UCAVs? Uh, UCAVs are uncrewed combat air vehicles, um, typically, uh, a large UAV or drone that carries bombs, missiles, that sort of thing. Um, and particularly it's used to refer to ones that really are designed as a primary capability of, of uh, striking using, using missiles or whatever to, to perform strike missions. The I-400's reference was at a time the largest submarine in the world in World War II. It was built by Japan. Um, and it had a large hangar on the top. That's what that yellow arrow is pointing to, which contained um, some seaplanes. And the seaplanes would take off from the submarine along that ramp that you see there um, on the top of the submarine and perform a bombing mission and then return to the submarine, be recovered, put back in a hangar. Yeah, it's not a popular idea. The thing that straight away comes to mind, though, are the cruise missile submarines of the 1950s and 60s, particularly the American ones. Um, and some of these were proposed, some very similar designs were proposed with, with aircraft. This is actually a missile, but, you know, um, I think it's very similar in size and characteristics generally to a modern UCAV. Um, it was a nuclear missile. It was abandoned when it proved that ballistic missiles, so Polaris, um, intercontinental ballistic missiles could be launched from submarines. That was the way forward. They, this was the contingency. They dropped it. Um, but you can see very large aircraft can be launched from submarines. However, the problem is the submarine has to surface. There's then a quite a complicated evolution of fitting the wings or whatever, because it's almost certainly need to make this, the missile or, or new cav much smaller to fit in the hangar. Um, the hangars you're not going to be able to carry very many of these aircraft. Um, the boat here, USS Greyback, would have carried two of these missiles. More if it's a smaller missile, but this is the Regulus II. Um, the large one I can think of would have carried four of them. Um, so depending on how big the submarine is, but you're not carrying very many of these UCAVs. And the submarine has to surface. You go through a complicated um, evolution to launch them, probably launch them one at a time. And then where are they going to land? What are they going to do if they don't drop their bombs? Or the idea of a UCAV is it is reusable. Um, but if you launch it from a submarine, how are you going to reuse it? Where are you going to land it? The stuff. There's some interesting concepts, ideas, but I think this is why it's not being done. It it's good for good for movies, I imagine. They should they should think more on this. Um, really interesting ideas with Harriet Jump Jets and stuff out there. Um, not very practical in real terms, not something a, a Navy would seriously take on. Obviously, much smaller UCAVs like loitering munitions, things like that, I think it's an entirely different question. Uh, but I think this is what you meant by UCAVs. OK, that's all the questions I've got time for, I think. Um, I say apologies if I didn't get to your question or if if I didn't understand it, I answered it in the wrong way. Um, if you've got new questions, do um, do put them in the uh, the comments of this video or um, on Twitter. Um, thank you for listening. Hopefully interesting. Um, I will probably continue to make um, occasional YouTube videos, but check out my website at covertshores.com.
um, that's where the main material is or other sites that I write for. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.